I know you probably, some of you have heard this, but I just want to make sure everybody is clear on it. Uh, you can have a participation level where you come to the classes, you get all the work, all, uh, all the materials, all the books, everything, but you don't necessarily feel you can do all the assignments or take all the exams. That's called participation level. It's still very, very valuable and uh, many people have done it and benefited from it. With the participation level, you cannot miss more than three days of classes per year. All right? Then there's the achievement level where you come to classes, you do all the work, get all the exams passed, and that's called achievement level. Okay? You can only miss one day of classes per year to be at achievement level. All right? Both are very valuable. In, at the graduation, those who do achievement level will be in cap and gown. Those who do participation level will be recognized and will get a certificate, but they won't be in the cap and gown. But that's not what you're in it for anyway. I know you're in it to learn about God's Word. So I, what, the reason I want to go over this with you is please don't feel like if you can't do all the assignments and pass all the exams that you're wasting your time because you're not. There, like I said, there's many people who have done participation level and greatly benefited. Also, uh, you might want to let your teachers know. I know there's in your year there's a couple of tests today. It doesn't hurt. Even if you're at participation level, just give it a shot. If you don't do that great, don't worry about it, okay? Uh, or you can let your teachers know, I'm just at participation level, so I won't uh, set the exam. However, don't ever miss a whole day of classes because you think, oh, there's, there's exams. There's no day where it will be exams in every single class, mm -hmm. okay? The exams are scattered throughout the year among the classes. So, like, if you have two classes today that have exams, well, you still have four classes where you get teaching, okay? So don't skip a whole day because one or two classes has an exam. It may be the same way in January as well. Now remember, this is your last day of classes for this year, this calendar year. You're off in December, and we won't meet till the last Saturday of January. So you've got a good long time now if you want to try to catch up on your work, uh, catch up on your reading. Like for this class, you're supposed to be reading the textbook we gave you. So take that time. Don't wait till the third week of January and say, oh, i got to do my work. you got two mm -hmm. whole months, okay? So work on it. Let me just go back to clarify too. With the achievement level, if you are going to graduate at achievement level in cap and gown, you must have achievement every year. You can't do participation one year and achievement another year. You know, if you want to do that, that's fine. But I'm just saying if you want to be in cap and gown at graduation, you do achievement all three years. Okay? Any questions about that? Any concerns? Yes. Yes. For example, if the day they did the exam, but they didn't do it very well. If what? Even, if the day for the test or the exam, if the person didn't do it very well, can he redo it again? Uh, some teachers, you can ask your teacher. We have had teachers let you redo the test again, okay? So, uh, you know, if, if maybe you're at achievement at every level, but one test you didn't do well on, I'm sure that teacher would let you reset the test, mm -hmm. okay? Now, don't take advantage of them, no, but, no. <laughs> but if that's a, a genuine concern. So, any questions from anyone? Okay. Uh, you know, we hope that each, each year at the graduation, uh, which is usually the first Saturday of July, each year for uh, your completion, you'll get a certificate, and then the third year is when you actually graduate. All right, so please keep that in mind, and um, anything you do learning God's Word is valuable, whether you get all the assignments done or not. So I hope you'll look at it that way. You're not wasting your time. You're taking time out to study God's Word, and you will only be better for it. Okay, so if you have any questions or struggles, please don't get frustrated. I know that many of you have been out of school for a long time, and so this is, you know, this is a strain on the brain, but you can do it and with God's help and your teachers are more than happy to help you. 
Let me also say that when you do have a test, uh, Sister Br Sabrina has sent you the materials. You're not to open it, whether it be on email or a hard copy. You're not to open it till the day of class. And then you need to get it right back to us, either to Sister Sabrina or to the teacher directly. You can post it in the mail or you can scan it and email it back, whichever works for you. But don't wait weeks to do this, okay? You get it right back uh, by Monday, for sure have it sent one way or another, okay? And you're on your honor with that, not to look at it until the day of class. All right, let's pray, and we're going to begin. I feel like this class in uh, today that we're going to talk about the tabernacle is one of the most important classes. It was for me when I started Bible school to really understand what the tabernacle is all about. So I'm glad you're all here today, and let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Lord, we thank you for this day, your blessings, your goodness, your mercy. Thank you for these students who have taken time out of their busy schedules to study your word. I pray that you'd help each of us today. Let us be keen, alert. Let us learn what you have for us in every class, O oh God. Be with us, strengthen us physically and spiritually and mentally. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. amen. Now, I sent uh, an email last night. Um, and some of you should have already had this, all of you should have already had this of the feast, the feast of the Lord. This was given last month and the tabern and the priesthood garment. Is there anyone who doesn't have this? Uh, blessing, did you take yours home with you? Okay, you can, you can look at mine. Okay. Go. All right, I want us to take a look at this. Now, we talked about Israel coming out of Egypt, and when they came out of Egypt, uh, they crossed the Red Sea, and then they began their wanderings in the wilderness. All right? Now, you may have heard this before, but it's very important to realize that when they left Egypt right here, or I'm sorry, right over here, and they're going to go to the promised land, they could have made that journey in 11 days, going straight over here. But instead, it took them 40 years. Does anybody know why? Does anybody know why it took them 40 years rather than 11 days? Take a guess. Disobeyed. Okay, they disobeyed and they did not believe God's promises. And so God said, there's some things that you folks need to learn. And so I'm going to take you down into this desert wilderness so you can learn it. Can I stop and say, have you ever felt like that? Hmm, I should have learned that lesson quicker. Instead, it's taken me weeks, months, maybe even years. But God is interested in your spiritual development. So, he may take you a roundabout way in order for you to learn your lessons. And that's exactly what happened with Israel. It could have been a quick journey, but they had some mighty important lessons to learn. So, they came here to Mount Sinai, and that's where God took Moses up on the mountain. And on the, at Sinai, God gave him three things. He gave him the Law, the Ten Commandments. That's what that is, the Law of the Ten Commandments, the priesthood, and the tabernacle. All right? So the Law, which was the Ten Commandments, the priesthood, and the tabernacle. And so uh, we want to look at those things today. And you have a picture of the priesthood. There are scriptures on there that you can take and look up. But what you're going to see from this class today is that God was a very detailed God. God just didn't say, okay, priest, go throw a robe on and do your duties. But every part of the garment had specific instructions and specific meaning. So that's really what's significant because today as we look at these things, we're going to see that God is detailed and everything is symbolic and has a meaning. See, the whole Old Testament was a foundation for the New Testament. 
Okay, so the, God laid the groundwork, laid the foundation, and there's a lot of symbolism in the Old Testament that then becomes clear and comes to pass in the New Testament. So take time. There's two pictures that you have there of the priesthood, and look it up. Everything was important, and the priest were the ones who carried out the uh, duties in the tabernacle. All right, so then you have also uh, a handout that says the Feast of the Lord. All right, and that, that again is front and back. You can take a look at it. And Israel was very much into remembering where God had brought them from and what he had done for them. All right, so you have this one chart here that gives you three categories of, of uh, feast that the Israelites established. And they still do this till this day. So you had the Passover, which involved three feasts, Pentecost, and then Tabernacles, which involved three feasts. If you look at the very bottom of this page, you'll see that what each stands for. Okay? The Passover showed to their remembrance the shadow of the crucifixion and a type of salvation. Okay? Remember when they came out of Egypt? that they were told to put the blood on the doorpost so the death angel would pass over them. So that's where the word Passover came from. So they had the Passover feast, the feast of the unleavened bread, and the feast of their first fruits. All right? Again, please take time on your own to look up these scriptures. Then the second category is the Feast of Pentecost, which is a, which is a shadow of Acts 2 Pentecost, and a type of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So 50 days after Passover was Pentecost. And then they had the Feast of Tabernacles, which involved the blowing of the trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and what's just called the Feast of Tabernacles. This is symbolic of what God wants to do at the end of the age and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as you see in the arrows, part of this has already been fulfilled and some is yet to be fulfilled. But those are priests, uh, feasts that they um, celebrate to this day. Look on the other paper here, the Feast of the Lord. On the back. Okay, let's just look again at the memorial aspect, the third column there. So the Passover helped them remember Israel's deliverance out of Egyptian bondage, the unleavened bread, the going out of Egypt, the first fruits, the crossing of the Red Sea. You know, Israel does set a good example for us in remembering back to what God has done for us. Sometimes we can tend, especially in the tough times, to remember all the good things God's done for us. So Israel established these feasts so they would never forget what God had done. Then Pentecost, they were to remember the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. Then the, the blowing of the trumpets to prepare the people for atonement and the day of the, celebrating the tabernacles. The day of atonement was when the priest opened the Holy of Holies, cleansing, and it remembered the cleansing of sins of the people. And the ta Feast of Tabernacles was entering into the Promised Land with great rejoicing. Okay, so all of these were memorials that they established. All right, so God gave them the law, the tabernacle, and the priesthood. All right, so we see they come to Mount Sinai here, and you have some pictures, some drawings that we've given you that we'll go through. All right, but this, what happened was after Adam and Eve were put out of the garden, that was God's ideal paradise where he would dwell with man. But after that, there was no place where God would actually meet with man. And he desired to do that. He desired for his people to have a meeting place where he could commune with him. So while they were wandering these 40 years in the wilderness, God gave them a tabernacle plan. And this was where they could come as a meeting place and God would meet with mankind. And it was basically the first church that was established. 
However, because they didn't stay in one place, it was a movable thing. It was a tent-like structure, as you see here. And all of it could be taken down and uh, prepared for travel. So they traveled with this these years in the wilderness. All right. Again, what you see from it is God was very specific. He was specific on dimensions. He was specific on color. He was specific on who could do what. He was con uh, specific on every single aspect of the tabernacle. And that tells us a very important thing, that God is interested in the details. Remember back to Noah's Ark? I think if Noah hadn't followed God's dimensions or used a different kind of wood, he wouldn't have made it. But because he followed God specifically, he did. And that's what we have to do. And as we go through this, I'll think you, I think you'll see more and more the detail and the specific things that God is interested in. The reason I stress that is because so many people and even some churches will say, Oh, well, it doesn't matter how you believe as long as you believe. Well, God was more specific than that. You know, even, the, even some other religions will say, well, you pray to your God, we pray to our God, it's all the same, and we'll all end up the same. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. What is the true word of God? The Bible. And we must follow what the Bible says for our salvation and for everyday living. Okay? God is interested in the details of your life. He doesn't just have seven billion of us and just say, okay, go whatever the seven billion want. But he says, what does Blessing want? What does Sabrina want? What does Chrissy want? What does Lee want? He, he hears and he's interested in every detail of your life. And that's why we need to go to him with every detail of our, our lives. Because he's God, he can do that for seven billion people. I couldn't do that. You couldn't do that. But he's God and he's interested in the details. All right, so let's look at this set of, of handouts that you have here. It's called the Tabernacle, and you won't have to do a lot of writing because I've kind of laid things out for you, but please do follow. So, as I said, the Tabernacle was a portable tent. It can be moved from place to place. Uh, the pattern of the Tabernacle started from the inside and moved outside. And isn't that how God works with us? God starts with our heart, and then as we grow in Him, as we develop in Him, the evidence is seen on the outside in the way we look, in the way we talk, in the places we go, in the people we fellowship with. God works from the inside out. And the tabernacle always faced east because the Jews thought the Messiah would come from the east. This is why we hear songs about the eastern gate or eastern sky. All right. Supplies for the tabernacle were provided by people bringing items for a special offering. They brought so much that they had to be restrained, and this had come out of what they had taken with them from Egypt. So there you see there was an outer court, the dimensions, and then the door that was 30 feet wide, and then inside the tabernacle proper. So this part right here was called the outer court, and this was the tabernacle proper inside. Okay, so again, a tent-like structure. Here's the door. There was only one way to get into the tabernacle, and that was through that door. All right, uh, there was no flooring in the tabernacle. Everything about it and the moving of it was detailed and orderly, just as God expects us to be. In the Old Testament, there are instances where the tabernacle procedure was not followed exactly and God was not pleased. A good lesson for us to remember. All right, turn over the page. And you can again see some drawings there of how the tabernacle was laid out. And then you look at these two drawings. All right, this one right here with all the little tents shows you, even God told them, this was all the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember the 12 sons of Jacob? They became what's known as the 12 tribes of Israel, their families. So even the way that they had to camp around the tabernacle, there was a specific order that they had to do that in. So there, 
they're all listed. All right, then we come to how was the tabernacle protected and covered? If you turn your page there, I think you'll see um, some tabernacle coverings. And this, there you go. Okay, so the tabernacle had coverings. Everyone find this page there. And then you have a page with some writing about it as well. All right. So you see there was a door that they had to go in, and the door had four posts, and there were specific colors of the curtains on those posts. All right, and you have dimensions given to you there. And then it says the coverings for the tabernacle proper. All right, who can tell me, read out just the four types of coverings there was for the tabernacle proper. What was the first one? Anybody have it there? White linen curtain. A white linen curtain. And then what was the second one? Anybody? Hair. Goat's hair. The third one? Lambskin. Lambskin dyed red. And the fourth one? Badger. The badger skin. And again, you have the scriptures there that you can look up. Now, what does all of this mean? In the tabernacle, the colors that were used were white, blue, scarlet, and purple. White always stands in the scripture for purity, blue for God's deity, scarlet for the blood that was shed, and purple for royalty. All of these attributes describe Jesus. The white represented the pure and was a barrier to keep sin out, and it re represented the way Jesus keeps the righteous pure from sin. John tells us that there's one way to get to Christ, and that was through the one door as we had at the tabernacle. The only way to get into the tabernacle was there, and just as Jesus is the only way to salvation. The four poles holding the curtains of the tabernacle represent the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Through the Gospels, they are the Gospels that present Jesus the gate for, uh, for salvation and for the world to see. Now, there's a very good lessons to be learned from the coverings of the tabernacle. Okay, the outermost one was the badger skin. It was ugly in color, and this covering shielded the tabernacle from the natural elements. It was not a beautiful sight, the badger skin. Okay, the serving Savior is represented. Then under that, we had the ram skins dyed red, representing the suffering Savior, who shed blood for us. The goat's hair was the substitutionary savior. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the Day of Atonement. Do any of you know what the Day of Atonement means? This was one of their feasts, and this is what happened. Every year on the Day of Atonement, they brought two goats. One they sprinkled blood on the furniture in the tabernacle, and one they laid their hands on and transferred the sins of the people to the goat. And he was sent into the wilderness, go on to the next side of that page, never to be seen again. All right? So just as that goat had the sins transferred to him and the sins were taken away, Jesus took our sins away and is the substitution for the goats. He was both goats, so to speak, okay? So no longer do we have to just come to Jesus once a year and our sins be taken away. But how often can we come to Jesus? Every day, every hour. It's not just once a year on a day of atonement. And then the, the innermost curtain inside the tabernacle that could be seen was light linen, white linen, pure, beautiful, and spotless. You couldn't see the beauty of the tabernacle from the outside. It is the same with Christ. Have you ever had people say, Oh, I don't want to be a Christian. That's not a very attractive life. You know what? They're looking at the badger skin. But if they will dare to come into the presence of God, just like all of us have, they will see the white linen, the beauty of living for God. So when people say things like that, just, just remember, they've not come into God's presence. They've not been in the inner tabernacle where God's spirit was felt. 
So they're just seeing the ugly badger sins and don't think the Christian life is an attractive one. But if they will dare to come into his presence, it will be a whole different story, as you and I know. So those were the coverings. You have also the picture of the gates of the tabernacle. Any questions so far? If I'm going too fast, just tell me. All right, then we come to the first piece of furniture within the tabernacle. And you have a drawing there. It's called the brazen altar. Okay. The altar of sacrifice or the brazen altar. Okay. The picture is on the back of the page with the writing. I, this was a place where the priest approached the tabernacle by way of the brazen altar where he offered the sacrifice for sin. All right, this was the place of sacrifice, of death, of shed blood. Who can read to us what Leviticus 17.11 says? You have it on the chart there with the picture. Leviticus 17.11, can someone read that? Anybody got it there? It's right on your chart with the picture of the brazen altar of sacrifice. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Great. All right, so this altar was made of brass and wood. It was called acacia, shittim, or gopher wood, all the same. And it was indestructible. It grows in the desert very hard, and the wood was overlaid with brass. The altar was big enough for all the other furniture to be put into it at once. And the brazen altar, the altar of sacrifice, always had a fire burning. Anyone could offer on this altar at any time. This is the only item of furniture that the common ordinary people like you and me could use. The rest of it was just for the priest. Alright, so what is the meaning? What is the meaning of the altar? Someone read what it means to us. Okay. Okay, you want to turn your microphone down there? We're not hearing you. The altar represents repentance in our life. That's where we are. Okay. So the altar represents repentance in our life. Until you sacrifice at the altar, you couldn't go any further. And that's what it is when we come to Christ. We must repent first. It was the largest piece of furniture, and so repentance plays a very large part in our lives. And the fire could never go out, and neither can the fire of our Christian experience. Repentance is available to all. God's always ready to receive us. So this first piece of furniture, here's a little model of it, was the altar of sacrifice. All right, then the next piece of furniture that we go to, you have the paper there, was called the brazen laver. Okay. The laver of water. All right. You have the same charts that I'm showing here. So you have the brazen altar and then the brazen laver. All right. And this was a place of cleansing. After the priest had made the sacrifice, then they had to go to the uh, brazen labor to be washed to get it, the, the mess off of them. All right. The scripture says, when they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord. So this was a place of cleansing, a place of washing. All right, very, very important. We don't know the exact shape of the labor, 
but it was made from mirrors. No dimensions are recorded. It had two bowls, though, an upper one for the hands, a lower one for the feet. And before going any further, they had to wash. So what do you think the labor represents in our salvation? Cleansing. Cleansing. And what do we do to cleanse from our sins? <laughs> Baptism. That's right. Baptism is essential. If the priest tried to go from the altar straight into the holy place, he would die. He had to go to the labor and be cleansed. So baptism is essential. We can go no farther until we have been cleansed at baptism. All right? So that's a very important place. All right, then we go to the altar of incense. You have next the paper and the picture. Okay? Let's get it on our chart here. The altar of incense. This was a place of worship and communion with God. Okay? Right over here. And this goes into the holy place, all right? So we had the two items outside, and then we're coming now into the holy place. Let's look at the altar of incense. This was a place of worship. All right, it gives you the dimensions there, again made of the same wood. It was the smallest piece of furniture. And this altar represents a place of prayer and praise in our life. It was the closest piece of furniture to what is called the veil. And we are closest to God when we praise and commune. It was the smallest piece of furniture and so may we feel small and insignificant. However, we know this is not the case. Neither is the long or the loud prayer necessarily the most effective. The fervent and sincere prayer is what's effective. This was the first piece of furniture where man did something for God. Within the brazen altar, God forgave. Within the laver, God cleansed. With the showbread, God fed. With the candlestick, God let, gave light. Here we see man doing something for God. So the incense that was burned in the evening smelled all day long. And how many of you know that if you don't start your day out with prayer and worship, it usually ends up being a bad day. All right? But if you start your day out with prayer and worship to God, it will last the whole day long, just like the aroma from the altar of incense. So this was a very important piece of furniture. This was called the holy place and three items, the candlestick, the showbread, and the altar of incense. All right, let's look at the candlestick. And you have a paper there about the candlestick. Maybe back here a bit. Okay. The candlestick was the only light in the tabernacle. It was the only light, and it was a golden candlestick with seven... Uh, arms on it. Uh, in today's value, it'd be, it would be worth at least 70,000 pounds monetarily. No real candles were used, but oil. All right? So just as this was the only light in the tabernacle, so is Jesus the only light of the world. Without the light of the candlestick, the priest couldn't go about his duties. The showbread represented the Word of God, and the candlestick is the light by which we are revealed the Word of God. So you must have a candle stick or you have a well-fed, dark church. All right? The, the Holy Spirit, the light of the world, Jesus. All right? And just as the candlestick was all one piece of gold, so we see one who suffered. He has been beaten, shaped, and molded for us, just as the candlestick was beaten, shaped, and molded. Just as the candlestick was costly, so was the price of our...